Good morning, everybody. It's, it's a delight to be with you again this Sunday. Uh, we are going to be looking at Exodus. I'm going to endeavor to get through Exodus 26 and 27 today, and I want to thank all of you for, for joining in. It's wonderful that we have this opportunity. And again, I want to express my, express my gratitude to the, um, to the leadership of the church, and specifically Les and Brian, who have been so helpful in setting these up. Uh, I just, um, it's mind-boggling how things have changed yet even more in the course of the last week. And on the way in, I was uh, thinking of a, of a great hymn, The Lord is my salvation, the grace of God has called for me and pulled, the, pulled me from the raging sea, but I am safe on this solid ground, the Lord is my salvation. What a wonderful rock and anchor we have in this storm. Uh, I want to remind everybody that there is an outline uh, handout available. Uh, I think the email went out yesterday. Uh, at the very end of that, by the way, I mentioned last week I was following up on Russ's recommendations that we redeem this time. Most of us probably find ourselves with a lot more time on our hands than we have in the past, uh, and to use that wisely for the glory of God. And I suggested a project reading uh, John Bunyan's The Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, my wife sent to me, and I have the link at the end of the outline. Uh, there is a website that you can go to, and you can actually watch an incredible animated version of this free. We watched this several months ago. Uh, we've talked about maybe having a night at some point in time in the church where we can do that. So uh, I, would, I would encourage you to look at that. It's, it's a wonderful way to spend an afternoon. Uh, and one other thing, I haven't been uh, asked to say this or coerced to say this, but but uh, think of the church in, in these hard economic times and, and don't, don't neglect to, to forward your offering uh, to the church. I strongly encourage you to pray about that and to do that. Let me open with a word of prayer before we get into the, to the word of God. And I'm going to take a passage out of the Psalms to start with. Psalm 73. Whom have I in heaven but you, and there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Father, as we gather this morning uh, as your people, we thank you, the living God, for having given us the word of truth for condescending to dwell with us as we will see in these passages of scripture. Lord, would you be the voice behind that of a mere man that we would have understanding, that we would clear our minds of distractions and know exactly what you would want us to learn from this, that we can learn about you, learn about us and what is required of us to be in your holy presence. And in understanding, walk in humble obedience to your word. And we ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. Well, a couple of things about this section of scripture I was saying to Barb yesterday. Uh, these may seem to be somewhat mundane. There's a lot of detail. It's easy to lose the forest for the trees. And I think the task of the person teaching this is to try to make this as interesting as possible. We're going to look at the design of the tabernacle, uh, the priestly garments, more about that next week. Uh, some of these unusual words that we hear, uh, Urim and Thummim, uh, Thummim, uh, we'll talk about that most likely next week. The last 16 chapters of the book of Exodus are devoted to uh, the tabernacle, the priestly garments, the priestly duties, and so forth. And, and one, of the, one of the commentators says it this way, and I, I love this because it has a lot to say about our lesson today. The last 16 chapters of Exodus juxtaposes the best and the worst. God's holiness and man's sinfulness, and that's what we're going to talk about today. And he also refers to man's sinfulness as the rebellion of Israel, the rebellion of Israel. When we look at the details of this, it's really not the, the apparatus for worship that is the important point. It's this, this elaborate system that God is giving the Israelites, and ultimately to us to a certain extent, it's his gift to instruct the people about his holiness and it's to establish a vehicle for proper worship and a fellowship with him as his redeemed people. So I want to keep that in mind. One other thing I wanted to mention, I, as I was looking at, we, we see the very, very best and unfortunately the very, very worst in these difficult and trying times. And I was just thanking the Lord yesterday for, 
Franklin Graham and the Samaritan's Purse Ministry and how they always go into the most dangerous hot spots in the world uh, to set up their tents to provide care, medical care specifically. And of course, they are doing that in Central Park. And of course, they have been the object of derision by those that claim that uh, he is a hate monger and a homophobe and so forth. But they're going to do the task anyway because it's right. And I thought of a song. Some of you may like new country music, but uh, an artist by the name of Brad Paisley, some of you have heard his name. I heard this song a number of years ago, and I wanna, I'm not going to sing it for you, so don't panic. But it's called Those Crazy Christians, and I think this is helpful for us today. Those crazy Christians, I was going to sleep in today, but the church bells woke me up and they're half a mile away. They pray before they eat, and they pray before they snore. They pray before a football game and every time they score. Every untimely passing, every dear departed soul is just another good excuse to bake a casserole. Those crazy Christians go and jump on some airplane and fly to Africa or Haiti, risk their lives in Jesus' name. No, they ain't the late night party kind. They curse the devil's whiskey while they drink the Savior's wine. Instead of being outside on this sunny afternoon, they're by the bedside of a stranger in a cold hospital room. And every now and then they meet a poor lost soul like me who's not quite sure just who or what or how he ought to be. They look to heaven their whole life. And I think, what if they're wrong, but what if they're right? You know, it's funny, much as baffled as I'm baffled by it all, if I ever really need help, well, you know who I'd call is those crazy Christians. So and I think of the life of Corrie ten Boom um, in the Netherlands during World War II that was instrumental in saving so many Jewish families from the Holocaust, who was ultimately uh, in turn at the, um, uh, the concentration camp, camp Ravensbrück. And she made this statement challenging all Christians in a talk that she gave a number of years afterwards. What have you t done today that only a Christian would do? Great challenge for, for these times. Well, let's look at the text here. Uh, chapter 26 is on, this, on the tabernacle. Um, Augustine of Hippo has been known to have said famously that thou hast made us for thyself, O Lord, and our heart is restless until it finds its rest in thee. We were made for fellowship. This is how God designed us. Believers want to see him. We want to know God. We want to fellowship with him. We search for the place where we can meet with God. This is why David said in Psalm 122, verse 1, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Of course, we need guidance and direction to do this purpose, uh, properly, and God in his mercy has provided this. We look at uh, chapter 26 at an initial glance. It, it seems like an unlikely place to have a close encounter with God. In fact, this chapter contains very detailed instructions for setting up God's tent, which is the tabernacle in the wilderness. And I think if we're true to ourselves, most of us are tempted to treat this like we do genealogies, just skim over them quickly. Um, architectural plans are, of course, necessary for a building project, but they don't make for the most interesting reading unless you're an architect or maybe a civil engineer or structural engineer. This wasn't any ordinary building, of course. It was a tabernacle of God, the place where earth touched heaven. This was the first earthly residence for heavenly's mighty, heaven's mighty king. We mentioned in chapter 25 last week in verse 9, we see the word tabernacle. The Hebrew word for that is mishkan, which is a derivative of a Hebrew v verb meaning to dwell. So the tabernacle was where God would live. And its construction, one of the things that I want to remind us of today is that its construction shows us very, two very important concepts. Number one is God's divine character. And number two, the requirements for sinners to meet with the holy God. Uh, this is so timely that we're doing this on what we call Palm Sunday, the triumphal entrance of, of Jesus into Jerusalem, and ultimately the rest of the week, Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Uh, this is really providential that we're doing it today. So God started showing Moses uh, the tabernacle's design in chapter 25, and initially he told him what to put inside of it, the Ark of the Covenant, the table for the bread and the lampstand. And of course, in chapter 26, we get a description of the tabernacle, not the entire complex, but the main tent, the tent of meeting, which housed the, the holy place and the most holy place, otherwise known as the holiest of holies. Uh, God gave instructions. He worked from the inside out. He begins with the Ark of the Covenant, which was in the Holy of Holies, and this was the place of his glorious presence. And then he works his way outside of that to the holy place where the, the lampstand and the table are located. And then God proceeds to tell Moses how to build the tent where these things were housed. 
and I think to understand the tabernacle properly, we need to understand some of the details of its construction. And of course, this requires patience. Um, in 26, chapter 26, verses 1 through 6, um, God tells Moses how to make the, the tabernacle proper. Uh, and he talks initially about the innermost layer of this. And I have, a, I think the last page, or a, uh, maybe an attachment to the outline, is one artist's rendition of, of the tabernacle. And, and understand, if you were to pool 50 artists, you might get 50 different renditions of this. So this isn't, this isn't the one from which we can say, aha, this is exactly how it looked. Uh, but I think it gives us sort of a good track to walk on here. The, the innermost lining, these were um, sheets of fabric. They were approximately six feet by 42 feet, very, very large, and they were sewn, sewn together in sets of five to make these two enormous curtains. And then they were joined by these 50 golden clasps. And these tapestries were draped over a frame to make the roof and the sides of the tabernacle. Um, I think about this, and of course today in modern terms, why you know, we have computers that can, that can program uh, sewing machines, or even in the days of primitive, primitive sewing machines, uh, think how long it would have taken to make this for the Israelites that had no modern conveniences and so forth. And I think just the amount of work that, went involved, that was involved in this and also the skill of the craftsmen that were involved in this also. So these were made of fine linen. They were adorned with colorful blue, purple, and scarlet yarn. And either woven into or embroidered onto these tapestries were images of the cherubim. And remember last week we said these are angels that are guarding God's throne. They are preventing those that are not holy from coming into the presence of a holy God. So that's the inner layer, this linen uh, embroidered with beautiful colors, cherubim, and so forth. Uh, it was covered with a layer of wool, which was in turn covered with two layers of animal skins. And the second layer of curtains uh, was made of goat hair. This is a sturdy fabric that uh, even today Middle Eastern nomads use to make their tents. These were slightly larger than the linen fabric underneath. And then two more layers were placed on top of this. It's almost like a tarp uh, that would protect all of this from uh, the weather, from the elements. And the outer tents were made of leather. Uh, some texts will say ram skins. Others will say the hides of sea cows. And of course, that always leads to the question, where in the world did they get the sea cows? I'm not going to go down that trail today. Um, you can use that as a homework assignment if you would like. <clears throat> well, we know that every good tent needs poles. And God told Moses how to construct the type of a sturdy frame that was going to be uh, utilized for this. And this was a frame, by the way, that was very common in tent making in the ancient Near East. We see this in verses 15 through 29 of chapter uh, 26. The upright frames were uh, pillars, 50 pillars or columns. They were made of wood, acacia wood covered with gold. They were about 15 feet tall, and they rested on silver pedestals. They had crossbars. It basically constructed a frame. Um, the tent curtains were draped over this interlocking framework, much like a circus tent today would be put together. Uh, obviously, this is a flat roof, not a peaked roof, but it consists of fabric stretched over a frame and ultimately pegged to the ground. I think that's what the diagram that I provided you has. Uh, the other thing about this is we have to remember that this is a portable structure. So it has to be able to be taken down, reassembled, and moved from one place to the other during the 40 years of their wilderness wanderings. Well, if we move on, and I, I'm, I'm I'm not going to read through this because this is, I will read through some of the, some of the sections, but um, it, it gets rather tedious. Not that this isn't important, it's very important. But in verses 31 through 35, once Moses knew how to make the tent, God told him what to put inside of the tent. And we see here verses 31 through 35, I will read some of this. You shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twined linen. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into it, and you shall hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold, with hooks of gold, and on four bases of silver. And you shall hang the veil from the class and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil. And the veil shall separate you, the holy place, separate for you, I'm sorry, the holy place from the most holy place. So this is the veil that's going to separate the tabernacle basically into two chambers, two different rooms, uh, sealing off the most holy place from the holy place, and again, the most holy place, also known as the holiest of holies. 
This entire structure was uh, a rectangle. It was about 15 feet by wide by about 45 feet long. And again, that's, I'm, some of you may, may dispute the measurements here. Uh, it all depends on what you consider a cubit to be. If it's about a foot and a half, then this turns out to be about 15 feet by 45 feet. The holy place was a rectangular chamber within this, and it was about 15 feet by 30 feet. And then, of course, the most holy place was the remaining part. And this was a perfect cube. It was 15 feet by 15 feet by 15 feet. And these two rooms, of course, were, were uh, separated by this veil. Uh, this veil is also, we're going to see in Exodus 39 and Exodus 40, I may have put that in the handout, I don't recall, uh, called the shielding curtain. And of course, this is the curtain that is torn in two. We see that um, in Matthew's gospel and in Mark's gospel. I'll mention this a little bit later here in the talk. Uh, this is the curtain that was torn in two when Christ died on the cross, gaining giving us unfettered access through Jesus Christ to the very presence of God. And of course, the contents of these two chambers, the Ark of the Covenant was placed in the most holy place and the table and lampstand in the holy place. Finally, uh, in verses 36 and 37, you shall make a screen for the entrance of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen embroidered with needlework. And again, I just marvel at the amount of skill and the time that it must have taken to build this. We don't really have that information. The Bible doesn't tell us how long it took for the Israelites to um, acquire all of the materials and then put the labor into them. And I, I don't think it's worth speculating uh, in an exact time, but it must have taken a phenomenal amount of time. Verse 37, you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia, overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold and you shall cast five bases of bronze for them. This is the doorway, the entrance way. Um, this is the flap that covers the entrance into the tabernacle. And of course, only the priests and the high priests were allowed to gain entrance. And we'll discuss that in a little bit because I think it has some really important theological uh, implications here. And although these instructions give us a fair idea of what the tabernacle looked like, it doesn't answer all of our questions. And as I mentioned earlier, if you look at a number of artists' renditions, you'll probably not find two that are exactly the same. You know, why are they not the same? Well, uh, some of the details were probably left to the, uh, the craftsmen to, to determine. And then we know that Moses was really the only one who ever saw the original model. And we don't know how was he given a vision of this or an actual blueprint of the original tabernacle. In Exodus chapter 26, verse 30, we see that the Lord says, then you shall erect the tabernacle according to the plan for it that you were shown on the mountain. We talked about this last week that God gave somehow Moses the plan for this. So he was the only one that was really privy to the original blueprint of this. Well, why are we studying the tabernacle? Why are we looking at the details of this? Uh, it's, it's really not so that we can draw pictures or come up with an artist's rendition, but it's to find out what we need to know about God and what we need to know about our relationship with him. Uh, again, providentially, I was listening to Renewing Your, Your Mind uh, on the radio yesterday. Uh, that's the, uh, the ministry of Ligonier, it's Ligonier Ministry. Uh, and again, uh, Dr. R.C. Sproul was the founder of that. We know that he's in heaven now, but we still can listen to him um, you know, through these media. And he was responding to a question that somebody gave him, what's the most important thing that non-believing secular people in America need to know? And he, he said they need to know who God is. Not that God is, but who God is. And then he was asked the same question about believers. And he said the same thing, they need to know who God is. That our understanding, our knowledge of God has probably been dumbed down over the years, but that every time we gather to worship, we should walk out of the worship service with a higher regard, a higher reverence, uh, humble adoration for our Creator. And we're seeing that in the plans here that God gives Moses for the tabernacle, for the priestly garments, and for the priesthood. Um, what did the tabernacle mean? Why did God tell Moses to set up the tent in this fashion? Uh, why did he want him to do it this way? Well, uh, ultimately, we know that God wants his people to see that the tabernacle was a glimpse of heaven on earth. Uh, and again, he tells us that, he tells Moses that in chapter 25, verses 8 and 9, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell in their midst. God wants to condescend to tabernacle with his people. What a wonderful God we have. 
He says, exactly as I show you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle and all of its furniture, so you shall make it. The details are very important to God, therefore they should be very important to us. Of course, the high priest would be the one that would get the best glimpse of heaven when he entered the most holy place, uh, God enthroned above the cherubim, above the mercy seat. And the heart of the tabernacle really was the holiest of holies where God would be reigning in his glory. But the tabernacle was also the heart of the nation of Israel. The 12, 12 tribes, were told, are camped around this uh, in, in divisions of three at all four compass points. And, of course, Israel would ultimately be at the heart of the world because this was the centerpiece in God's plan of salvation for all nations, first for the Jew, then for the Greek, then for the Gentile. But one of the things that we see as, as we look at this is that the Israelites were confronted with a hard reality, a hard, hard reality. God's presence was right in front of them, but most of them would never have the opportunity. They were never permitted to go inside. They could look at the structure, but they couldn't go inside. They couldn't go past the door. In fact, we even wonder if they were even, to, even able to peer inside of that uh, while they're wandering in the courtyard, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Uh, but we know that they could never gain access. It had very limited access. And of course, the reason for this was to showcase the supreme holiness of God. He's pure in majesty. He is pristine in righteousness. He is just, and of course, that means that his justice, his holiness mandates that he punish sin. The Israelites knew that God demanded perfect obedience and that they were sinners, and that even when God came close to them, they still had to be separated for him. So this shows the holiness of God, the sinfulness of man, um, the rebellion of Israel, as the one scholar refers to it. But there was a way to enter. God, in his mercy, gave access to this, but there was only one way. And the curtains were doorways through which a representative could enter on behalf of the people, first Moses and then ultimately the high priest. But there was something that was required, an atoning sacrifice had to be presented for the sin of the representative as well as the sins of the people. This was the only way by means of a blood sacrifice. And one of the things that has become clear to me as I've read through this text a number of times is, uh, and even throughout all of the Old Testament, all of the Hebrew scriptures, is we see the doctrines of grace coming through, uh, maybe not quite loud and clear, maybe as Paul says, as through a glass, though dimly, but they're here. And this, in embryonic form, is the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. Uh, we see that right here. Without a blood sacrifice, it's impossible to enter this. And I was, I was reminded of a Psalm of David. Let's see if I can find it here. Yeah, Psalm 24. This is also, I think some of the lines from this can be found in 2 Samuel when the Israelites, uh, under David's leadership, are bringing the ark back into Jerusalem. You remember the story about how they carried it in front of them during the battle, and it was uh, captured by the Philistines. And that very, very interesting story. But David asked this question, Psalm 24, beginning with verse 3. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in his holy place? These are great questions that David is asking. And he answers them. He who has, a, who, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. So David wants to know who can ascend the hill of the Lord, who can be in the presence of God. Of course, one way we could do this would be by living a perfect life, right? By fulfilling the righteous requirements of all of the law of God. Of course, we, we know of it that Adam couldn't do this, and all of his progeny fail at doing this as well. We can't do that, so our access must be on the basis of a perfect representative. And of course, Jesus Christ is the true tabernacle of God. It was as the God-man that Christ was sacrificed. He paid the penalty for sin. And of course, we know that at the moment that Jesus died, something incredibly miraculous occurred. There were a lot of supernatural events going on at that time while there was darkness over the land. But the curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place was torn in two. Uh, Matthew records that in chapter 27, Mark in chapter 15. 
And of course, this is indicative of now having unfettered access to the presence of God through the mediator, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is how we gain access to God through Jesus Christ and by faith in him and by faith in him alone. So that's uh, chapter 26. I I will pause. Um, I think last week you were made aware of the the fact that questions could be asked, and if there are any questions, wonderful. If not, that's fine, too. We'll move on to Exodus 27. Exodus 27, in in my um, ESV translation, it starts out the subheading, The Bronze Altar. Well, first of all, by way of review, the high king of heaven comes down to earth to dwell with his people. And this was the meaning of the tabernacle, so that God could dwell with his people, to divulge to them his attributes, their sinfulness. Uh, And, of course, to accomplish this, we have this carefully planned and constructed tabernacle. Uh, God made the tabernacle to communicate his supreme holiness as well as his covenant love for his people. This is something that we have to dwell on also, the covenant love for God and his condescension to dwell with human beings, with sinful human being, beings, ultimately to provide the way of salvation uh, through the line of David, through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first piece of furniture we see that's, that's actually outside of the tabernacle proper, and remember that this is a, a rectangular tent that has two chambers, the holy place and the most holy place, separated by this large, thick, heavy veil. Outside of that is the altar of bronze, Uh, One of the commentators refers to this as God's stove. This is an altar for for sacrifice, and the instructions are given in the first eight verses of of chapter 27. This was actually the largest piece of furniture that we see in the tabernacle. It's approximately seven feet wide, um, seven feet long, and about four feet in height. It's literally a box. It's it's a grill, if you will. It was square-shaped. It had horn-like projections from each of the four corners. And archaeologists tell us that this style of altar was very common in those days in the ancient Near East. In fact, uh, excavations near uh, Beersheba as well as Dan have discovered altars like this. I remember when Barb and I were in Israel, I believe it was about three years ago now, um, and uh, what a wonderful trip. And it was was really like drinking from a fire hose because uh, we spent two weeks you know, I think we were on the buses at 7 a.m. and we got back around 7 p.m., but we went everywhere. We were able to get up to the north, uh, the Golan Heights area, just an amazingly somber place with a memorial to the, to the Six-Day War. Uh, but the, our, our leader, our, our pastor leader on the bus, a gentleman by the name of Terry Boyle from the U.K., uh, was telling us when we were in the area of Dan uh, where the tribe of Dan actually fell into idolatry, and they have... Uh, they've erected a steel structure that, that looks very similar to the altar that they, ultimate, that, they, that they built initially for God and then ultimately used it for Baal worship and Baal sacrifices. You know, what a, what a tragedy in that. It was, uh, it was funny. Terry Boyle was just he was a wonderful guy. We were so blessed to have him as, as our guide. And everywhere we went, he would read scripture and he would tell us the history and so forth. And I, he had a, you know, just a wonderful British accent. Um, and th- he, he was part of um, Chuck Swindoll's ministry uh, in the UK, and I asked him what he actually did, and he said, well, I, I, treat, I, I, I translate Pastor Swindoll's sermons and talks into English. So, <laughs> obviously a little dig at the way that we speak English language, but at any rate, it was a wonderful time. Uh, so this altar was made of wood. It was overlaid with bronze. Thus far, most everything that we have seen from a metal standpoint, is either gold, predominantly gold, but also some silver. The utensils for use in this altar or this stove, if you will, were bronze as well. And there's a practical reason, a metallurgical reason for using bronze here. Bronze is a lot more durable. It's more heat resistant uh, than most metals. I don't know about its density or its weight because, uh, you know, like everything in the tabernacle, the, the altar was designed to be portable. It had to be moved from place to place. And and um, uh, it was a hollow structure. It came with carrying poles. Uh, we might sort of liken it to like a barbecue grill. You can actually see inside of this. And when I think about 
the work that went into moving this to transporting this, I, that, that's just another thing that just boggles my mind. I don't know if, if any of you at some point uh, in, in your walk with the Lord have been involved in a church that doesn't have a, a, a wonderful facility as we do here at Twin Oaks, but uh, they may have to set up in a gymnasium or uh, a hotel conference room. Uh, we were actually part of a church uh, that did that a number of years ago. And the amount of work that went into setting up and tearing down was just unbelievable. It was very wearying. I mean, it was really, uh, you had to get there at least, a, in fact, most of the time, you'd be there all morning long, no matter if the service lasted 45 minutes or an hour, you'd be there at seven in the morning and probably wouldn't finish until one in the afternoon, uh, depending upon how ornate and elaborate this particular church wanted to have its decor and also the, the, the musical side of it too, all that equipment. So this is a tremendous amount of work and of course it took a lot of faith on the part of the Israelites to continue to, to do this. Well, the bronze altar, chapter 27, verses 1 through 8, we move on to the court of the tabernacle. Uh, verse 9 of chapter 27, you shall make the court of the tabernacle. On the south side of the court shall, the, on the south side, the court shall have hangings of fine twine linen, 100 cubits long. For one side, it's 20 pillars, and their 20 bases shall be of bronze, but the hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver, and we get more dimensions about this. So th this tells us that this tabernacle, and again, we'll call it the tent, the tent of meeting, was not a freestanding structure. It was surrounded by a fence, literally. Uh, the altar was outside of the tent, but it was inside the perimeter of the fence. In other words, it was sort of in the middle of this courtyard. And of course, God gives very specific instructions for the entire enclosure. So we'll take a quick look at, at the fence, which marked the outer boundary of the tabernacle. Uh, and again, using a conversion factor for, from cubits to our modern feet, we don't use the metric system much in, in America, measured about 75 feet by 150 feet, the entire perimeter of this, the entire structure. That's about 10,000 square feet, roughly the equivalent of maybe four tennis courts, if that gives you an idea of how, how large this was. Uh, the tent of meeting took up less than 1,000 square feet of this 10,000, so that left a tremendous amount of open area, plenty of room, and we know that the, um, the fence consisted of, of 60 pillars. They were set into 60 bases and joined by white linen curtains. It was about eight feet tall. And of course, these pillars were covered with silver and bronze, all these fine metals, and, and that's another thing I think about the amount of time that it would take these craftsmen uh, to work on, on metal to, uh, to do some degree of refining this so that it would be appropriate for being used in, used in God's tabernacle. Verses 17 through 19, all of the pillars around the court shall be filleted with silver, the hooks shall be of silver, and their bases of bronze. The length of the court shall be 100 cubits and the height five cubits with hangings of fine twined linen and bases of bronze. Um, there was one way into the courtyard, and of course God gives instructions for that. The entrance was made of the same cloth that actually adorned the inside of the tabernacle, this white linen that was embroidered uh, with blue and purple and, and scarlet thread. Uh, I will tell you that in, in, in doing some research on this, there has been a lot of ink wasted, I think, on the meaning of the different colors. I, I, the Bible, it clearly doesn't tell us what they mean. I, I, I think of uh, when Alistair Begg comes to passages of scripture like this where people waste a lot of time, he'll say, yeah, in that Bible study or study school class, the, the, uh, they pooled their collective ignorance to try to figure out what this means. We just, we just don't know. They were absolutely beautiful, though we, know, we do know that. So again, three main sections to the tabernacle. There's the courtyard, this perimeter fence. Within that is the tabernacle itself, the, the tent of meeting, which ha houses the holy place and the most holy place. And uh, these separated actually three different types of worshipers. And it may be over-spiritualizing this a little bit, but if we look back to uh, remember Moses and the 75 elders ascending uh, Mount Sinai, uh, everybody goes up to a certain level and it's just Moses and Joshua and then just Moses. So almost the same type of three different, uh, the same picture of three different types or kinds of worshipers, and only the high priest, the mediator between the people and God, was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. The remainder of the priests could only enter 
the holy place. And of course, the people were kept outside with their access limited only to the courtyard. And this was only for Israelites, by the way. You might say, well, were there any uh, Gentiles that accompanied them? And uh, possibly, we don't know. I don't want to speculate on that. Where the Bible is silent, we must not shout. But the only way that a Gentile could enter this would be a Gentile proselyte to, to Judaism that would undergo the rituals of Judaism, including circ circumcision. And then they would be permitted to enter this. But this was limited to God's people. Uh, and the limited access was, of course, intended to teach the Israelites that they were separated from God by their sin. They needed a mediator. And, of course, I immediately thought of 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Verse 6, who gave himself as ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. And, of course, we're in the season where we are remembering uh, this God-man mediator, the mediator who made reconciliation to God possible for for us. A question. Oh, question, sure. Yeah, this is from me. Oh, okay, uh, Les is giving me a question here. So I'm looking at the uh, uh, diagram. This, this area, like you said, about four tennis courts are half of a football field long, a little wider than the football field. Uh, how many people, I mean, how do you suppose people were cycled in and out or could hang around non-priests, obviously, in and around the outer court? And, you know, would they, a lot of people outside. So, yeah. walking through. Uh, yeah. So, Les Prouty has asked a question. I don't know if you heard, heard the question. You know, how, uh, there's a lot of people, you know, probably over a million, maybe more than a million Israelites uh, in the 12 tribes surrounding this. Um, how do you accommodate for that? I mean, it is a large area, but to think of if you had everybody in there at the same time, they, there would probably wouldn't be much room. Uh, and of course, there wouldn't be such a thing as social distancing under, under, under these circumstances. So uh, it's interesting because there's speculation about that, that, that certain tribes were allowed to go in at certain times. Um, you know, it's, it's like when you're with a large group like we were at Israel, okay, tables one, two, and three can go up to the cafeteria line for their food now. It may have been something like that. We, we really don't know. Uh, but what we do know, I'm going to get to in just a moment, uh, it's a, that's a very, very good question. Uh, and again, most of what I, I read didn't get, the, I mean, it was pretty much that was the answer. You know, they probably couldn't all fit in at the same time. Uh, we don't really know the exact number, but we, we can draw some pretty good conclusions. So there, there must have been a, a way of allowing people to go in at certain times, uh, spending a, so much time there, and then getting out. Uh, we know that uh, in the Old Testament economy, uh, the only place to gain access to God was in the tabernacle, ultimately the temple, of course, Solomon's temple. But the first step was to enter the courtyard, and this was a very, a very busy place because not only would there be priests and Israelites, there would be animals. So uh, that's why, again, most of the scholars feel like there had to be designated times because you were going to come in with an animal to sacrifice on the altar of bronze. And of course, the, most of what I read, it's very interesting, and I hadn't thought of this, is the Israelites loved to go there. They loved to go there because that's where they got forgiveness. Do we love to go to the cross because that's where we get forgiveness? And as gratitude for that forgiveness, do we dedicate our lives to Christ, not just as Savior, but as Lord over all? The first thing that they would see upon entry was this flaming altar, this bronze altar. Uh, and the first thing that they would do would be to make a sacrifice for their sins. Uh, God is holy. We are not. A blood sacrifice has to be made if our sins are going to be forgiven and we're going to be reconciled to God. Um, I love the book of Hebrews, and in chapter 9, verse 22, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness, forgiveness of sins. The Israelites knew the only way for them to have forgiveness, and of course this would be a temporary forgiveness, because they would have to do this over and over again, the only way they could be reconciled to God was on the basis of a blood sacrifice, and, and, and here we have, again, the doctrine of substitutionary atonement, the atonement ultimately made by Jesus Christ. And I know that this may sound unpleasant, the paying um, of the price for sin with blood. In fact, uh, this, as many of you know, this has come under intense criticism by liberal theologians. I, I 
think the man that kind of started this movement, I could be wrong, I think it was a guy by the name of Brian McLaren in, in the UK that has publicly decried this doctrine of substitutionary atonement, saying that you know, God, this would be, this, would, this is like accusing God of cosmic child abuse to punish his own sin. Uh, but scripture tells us there is no other way. Um, people may dislike Christianity or Christians because of the exclusivity, the one way only. Uh, that's, not, that's not what we say, that's what God says, that's what Jesus tells us. But, but understand this, and if you're, if you're involved in any form of apologetics or discussing this with other individuals, every single religion is exclusive. All truth is exclusive. There isn't one religion. Maybe the Baha'i faith, they pretty much include everybody, although they don't like to include people like Christians that exclude other groups. So, um, but there's no other way. There's, we, we, we as sinners can't come into the presence of God unless an atonement has, made for sin, has been made for sin. And of course, we see this throughout all of the Bible. We know that it was true for Adam and Eve. It was true for, for Noah and his family, for Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Moses and the Israelites, as depicted in the Passover, Exodus chapter 12, that we looked at quite some time ago. And it's true for us today, as this season reminds us. Paul tells us that God presented him, Jesus that is, as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. That's Romans 3.25. There is no forgiveness, forgiveness of sins without the payment of a blood sacrifice. That's what the Israelites did. And of course, this was just a type of the ultimate anti-type, the person who worked for the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the question that, that, that we all have to ask ourselves, I, I mean, this is intellectually easy to understand, I think, for most of us that are believers, but have you and I fully trusted and trusted only in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ? You know, even the devils believe and they shudder, they know doctrine. But have we personally put our faith and trust, and are we walking in a manner worthy of our calling, as Paul says? Uh, John Calvin famously said that all that Christ has done on behalf of guilty sinners is of no benefit as long as we remain outside of Christ. Are you inside Christ? Am I in Christ these days? Questions that we all have to ask ourselves. Examine yourselves to see that you're in the faith. Well, I'm going to take a little bit of a detour here. I think we're doing pretty well on time. Um, I want to look at this, the, the issue of the altar of God before we go to the last section, the, the oil for the lamp, interesting section. I think to fully understand what God has done for us through Christ and his cross, it is helpful to understand more about the sacrifices that the Israelites made on their altar. Uh, remember, they had one altar, just one altar for the entire nation, and it was almost in constant use, constantly being used for sacrifices. Um, this is going to take us maybe into some difficult, deep sledding. Um, the book of Leviticus, there are five main kinds of required sacrifice, and they're described in the, in the opening five chapters of Leviticus. I'm going to attempt to summarize them here. If uh, Please be like the Bereans, check me out, you know, read this. I, uh, I know imploring you to read the first five chapters of Leviticus might be, sound like somebody putting their fingernails on a chalkboard, but... Um, if you look at it in terms of what these offerings, these sacrifices are, I think you'll get a much better understanding for the, for the book of Leviticus. But five kinds of offerings. First of all, the burnt offering. And I do have these in your handout, handouts, by the way. Uh, this is a general sacrifice for sin. Uh, the entire animal here is consumed on the altar. All of it is burnt. All of it is sacrificed. There's nothing left over. Um, there may be some scraps of bones or what have you, but those are discarded. And this represents atonement for sin as well as important here, complete surrender to God, consecration to God. This was performed twice daily in the nation of Israel. Grain offering, this is part of the harvest, it's dedicated to God, it's a, a, a thanksgiving offering for the blessings that God has provided on their harvest. Uh, and, and the grain offering, only part of it is burned on the altar, the rest of it is given to the priests. Burn offering, grain offering, Fellowship offering, part of the animal is sacrificed to God, part of it eaten by the worshiper. And I think you can see the symbolism here. This symbolizes reconciliation with God or fellowship with God on the basis of a sacrifice that we can actually tabernacle, dwell with him, eat with him. And then finally, the sin offering and the guilt offering, 
sometimes these get a little bit obscure, and, and ev even at this point in time, I'm not 100% sure on the exact difference, but an atonement was made for sin, and this was either for the sin of the individual or the entire nation, it could be, and whether or not the sin was deliberate, um, sin offerings were oftentimes for sins that were not intentionally committed but did happen. Guilt offerings were offerings that were sometimes provided uh, if you thought, maybe I did sin, maybe I neglected part of God's holy law. When I think of this, when I think of the guilt offering, I think in the book of Job. Remember how Job would make sacrifices for his children just in case they had committed sin? I mean, you know, what a wonderful godly man. And of course, when you think about the time of Job, when did Job occur? Uh, if Job is making sacrifices, Job is not part of the Levitical priesthood, so we know that he lived probably during the time of the patriarchs. I mean, that's one way we can sort of put all of this together. Um, but the sin and the guilt offering, two things about this. Number one, the blood was sacrificed on the altar uh, to show that the animal had died, and then its death is applied to the sinner. And again, the doctrine of substitutionary atonement coming through, I think, loud and clear here. Now, it's interesting because this would explain why if we see just these five, and these are not the only ones, but these are the required ones under Levitical law, explains why the bronze altar was always burning. Uh, and here's another doctrine that we see coming through loud and clear. This is a powerful witness to the total depravity of Israel, which is the total depravity of all of us. The doctrine of total depravity. I know some of you might be thinking that, oh my goodness, he's trying to hit at the five points of Calvinism. No, I'm talking about the doctrines of grace. Uh, if we want to call them that, then be my guest. John Calvin would probably not be happy to have his name applied to doctrines. He wants to give all the credit to Christ. God saves sinners. That's what Calvinism is. Um, but this is a powerful witness, all these sacrifices. You know, imagine how many sacrifices were made, had to be made on the altar. Uh, at least two every day, at least two for more than a thousand years. Uh, A.W. Pink, an author that I've mentioned in the past, I've, I've commended to, to you this little book that he wrote. It's, 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 it's kind of thin paperback. It's called The Attributes of God. I would highly recommend that everybody have that on their bookcase, on their bookshelf, and read it. Um, he said, this is what he says. Pink says this. There it stood, ever smoking, ever blood-stained, ever open to any guilty Hebrew, that might wish to approach it. The sinner, having forfeited his life by sin, another life, an innocent life, must be given in its stead. The wages of sin is death. Paul tells us that in Romans chapter 6. Um, I've mentioned that before, talking about the concept of sin to colleagues of mine, and, and if they're of a Jewish background, Jewish, Jewish ethnicity, one of the things that they will tell me, oh, oh that, wait, hold it, you know, we don't believe in the New Testament, that's, that's just New Testament stuff the Christians made up. Uh, and I said, well, well, wait a minute, no, this actually comes from your scriptures, the Hebrew scriptures um, in Ezekiel chapter 14, the soul that sins must die, the soul that sins must die. So this is all the way throughout all of scripture. That's why Pink says, the sinner forfeited his life by sin, and therefore a life, an innocent life, must be given in its stead. You know, when I, I think of all the bulls, the goats, the lambs, the pigeons that must have been required to atone for sin, the sin of a million people a day for a millennium, every day for a millennium, um, you know, this would have been like, like treadmill work. I mean, just repeating these things over and over and over and over again. And I, I, I had an email exchange with one of our neighbors up in Montana recently who was telling me that, uh, you know, under the, um, the shelter in place, um, requirements that he went down to visit one of our other neighbors uh, who, whose wife has had a lot of health issues. And he used this description, I, I wanted to rescue him from his Sisyphusian um, tasks. And I, you know, some of you may know something about Greek mythology. I remember having to take that class in, I think it was eighth grade, but there was this mythical character by the name of Sisyphus that was given this task that he had to push this large stone up a hill and every time he got to the top, he was so weary, it would roll back down. And he did this over and over and over and over again. So uh, they did this all, you know, over and over again. But it's interesting because this was never enough, was it? If we go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, verse 3 and 4, but in these sacrifices, there was a reminder of sin every year. For it is impossible 
for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. These are so telling because it tells us that what man needs is what? A perfect sacrifice, one that does away with sin once and for all. And of course, that's what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And as we enter this week, I hope we will reflect upon the wonder of the cross. One perfect sacrifice to atone for sin forever. And the words of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24 through 26, remind us of this. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands. We're not talking about him entering into a a man-made tabernacle, which are copies of the true things. But he's entered into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Once for all, never to be repeated. Never to be repeated. Hallelujah, what a saver. So when we, come to, when we approach God today, we come by the way of the cross. Um, one of my favorite Puritans is, is the theologian, pastor, teacher, John Owen. John Owen says it this way, the altar which we now have, going back to the Old Testament, the altar of bronze, but he's saying the altar which we now have is Christ alone and his sacrifice. For he was priest, altar, and sacrifice all in himself. If we trust in Christ alone, then we have an atoning sacrifice and our sins are forgiven. Let me briefly look at the last couple of verses in this, um, verses 20 and 21, this oil for the lamp, you shall command the people of Israel that they bring to you pure beaten olive oil for the light, that a lamp may regularly be set up to burn in the tent of meeting outside the veil that is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall tend it, this is the beginning of the Levitical priesthood, from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever to be observed throughout their generations by the people of Israel. So up to this point, you know, Exodus has said virtually nothing about the priestly duties. Uh, the priests, actually their garments and, and the priests and their duties. But I think we can deduce a few things that they tended to this lamp. Um, we have an idea of what they did based upon the way the tabernacle was set up. They made the holy bread, placed it on the table, and they offered sacrifices on the altar. They cared for sacred objects, and they tended this fire. And, of course, the priests were the ones that were responsible for setting it up, tearing it down, carrying it from one place to another. Uh, whenever God and his people were on the move, that's what they did. They kept this light burning on the golden lampstand that we see in this passage. If you see depictions of this, it may look like what we would call today a menorah. Uh, it stood in the holy place. If it's outside the holy of holies, in the shape of a tree, it was a symbol of light and life. God commanded a special type of oil. This is the finest quality. He says it was pure beaten oil. It wasn't crushed, so there wouldn't be any pulp or residue from the olives in it. There's a reason behind this. Um, pure oil would burn nearly smoke-free with a clean and pure life. You know, there's a lot of debate over, in fact, I think the scholars are about 50-50. Did this burn just at night? Did it burn all day and all night? We, we don't really know. But it is clear that it represented the eternal presence of God, a light shining for his people, and a symbol of his constant and watchful care. Well, let me close with this, and I think this is really important, and we can reflect on this this week as we enter into Holy Week and um, Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Hallelujah. He is risen. You know, now that Jesus has paid the penalty for our sin, God no longer requires us to bring a sacrifice, does he? That's already been done, once for all, never to repeat it. But he does want us to become a sacrifice. Paul says in Romans 12:1, offer your bodies as living sacrifices holy and pleasing to God. This is a sacrifice we make, not on a bronze altar, but on the altar of our own minds and hearts. So we made it through 26 and 27. Um, We will not convene next week uh, just the worship service only on Easter Sunday, but Lord willing, two weeks from today, I will be back. Uh, Les and I will be back here to to continue. I would would go ahead and read through... um, Let's look at 28, 29, and 30. Uh, Maybe we can make it to 31, but at least those. So uh, I'll close with a moment of prayer here. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the truth, the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ who made the once and for all sacrifice so that those of us that would put our faith and trust in him could be in your presence in heaven eternally. Lord, uh, make us willing servants of the King of kings and Lord of lords, and, and help us to share this great message. Lord, souls are perishing and time is flying. 
We need to get the message out, and what a wonderful opportunity we have. I pray for Russ and the members of the worship team today that they would bring a fragrant aroma to your nostrils and that lives would be transformed. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much, everybody.